China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. The West, viewing China as a strategic rival, is uneasy about China's accomplishment and potential, especially in science and technology. One of the stats alarmist pundits frequently cite is the sheer number of STEM graduates China produces every year. The number is projected to be twice as many as those in the U.S. by 2025. But a spike has less to do with any grand scheme of the government to groom talents than with the general expansion of higher education. From 1997 to 2022, over a quarter century, annual college enrollment in China has increased more than 10 times, from 1 million to 10.8 million. The rapid expansion of higher education has, well, in addition to many positive impacts, resulted in an oversupply of graduates and depreciation of economic value of education. Back in my parents' generation, college graduates, the cream of the crop, were in great demand because, one, Chinese economy was taken off, and two, after a decade of cultural revolution, college degrees were in economic scarcity. When I was in college before the financial crisis, the economy was roaring. Every self-respecting student with a decent IQ wanted to become an investment banker, a go into advertising or FMCG or big tech firms. It followed the money. Okay, only dorks like me ended up in the media. But I still consider myself lucky. Well, as a bachelor, I got my degree from an okayish university overseas, and I entered profession early. So now I can have more educated people with more advanced degrees working for me. Sorry, guys. C'est la vie. You see, when the economy slows down or focuses on quality growth, so to speak, it couldn't buoy the labor market. Existing positions filled, few vacancies available, and cooperation structurally favors the incumbents. Now, if you pay attention to the news. There are a lot of stories about master's or doctor's degree holders doing less sophisticated works for meager income, like selling sausages on the street. And overseas returnees, dubbed as seed earls, who used to be a coveted human resource, are now rotting their parents' homes. Because corporate world just turns out to be much less pretty than they imagined. They thought if they could get ahead of the peers at school, they would work their way up outside school too. Essentially, young people have three choices. One, outcompete your colleagues and fight for leftovers, even if it means compromising labor rights. And two, go back to school, get another degree, and hope the market will get better, which is what almost half of the undergraduate chose to do last year. Or three, settle for mediocrity. Mediocrity? That word hurts so bad in, in a meritocratic society. Now, this is interesting. Let me digress a bit. So, both China and U.S. are ferociously meritocratic, but we seem to emphasize on different aspects of the word. For China, it's about merit or ability building, and for America, it's about courtesy or the rule. Okay, perhaps this is why meritocracy is defended in China as a commoner's hope, but it's attacked in the West as a means to entrench elite rule. The imperial examination of ancient China and its modern reincarnation of notoriously difficult Gaokao often cited as good examples of Chinese meritocracy. Exams provide fair chances for all, regardless of their birth, to join the ruling class to become Mandarin officials or investment bankers. And education has always played a vital role. A thousand years ago, an emperor of Song Dynasty who was posthumously titled Truthful wrote a poem to encourage students to learn. He said, Nowhere else should you look, because golden mansions, exorbitant salaries, and beautiful women are all that are in your books. I don't know if modern feminists take offense in those words, but what he said about education being a ticket to the high society was widely regarded as a time-tested truth in China. Almost all parents tell their children to swallow the bitterest pill at school, which is to study. Some other day, you will sit on top of the lowly men, those farmers, workers, grocers, builders, janitors, waiters, barbers, masseurs, pedicurists, and delivery drivers. If you don't want to end up like them, study hard. Recently, a video of a teenage student rebutting middle-aged professor went viral in China. The professor was telling students to study hard in order to make more money, enjoy more material success, and crossbreed with white girls to improve the Chinese genes. Yes, it literally said crossbreed. 
So the angry teenager said, no, we don't study to get rich. We don't study to cross breed with Americans. We study for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. If you're familiar with Chinese officialese, you'd recognize that verbatim quote of the Chinese dream, which has been front and center of Chinese national strategy since 2012. Of course, the internet applauded his patriotic idealism and accused the professor of corrupting young minds. I mean, it's never wrong to praise an idealist, to disdain vulgar materialism, and to despise someone who has less noble ideas about success, to purge our educators of decadent influences, to feel like guardians of our nation's future, and to feel good thinking that you have strong moral fiber. But you could think such mentality is limited to that particular uncouth middle-aged man, you'd be lying to yourself. There's no denying that the professor was definitely a racist, a sexist, a bigot, but he was no hypocrite. If you detoxify his language, it basically meant the world is yours for the taking after you get to the top. And you get to pick and choose from the healthiest and best looking human beings to procreate. Do you really think there's a world of difference between what he said and what the truthful emperor of song or your parents been telling you? Study hard now, so you can sit on top of those losers later. It's always been like that. In a world where there isn't abundance for everyone, there is inequality. The first and foremost important thing in an unequal society is maintaining upper mobility. Or to give people equal chances at economic success. It's not American dream or the Chinese dream, but a universal dream. To us every Joe and Jane, education is our coin token to that dream machine. What will happen if this very coin itself is losing purchasing power due to knowledge inflation? If we invest in educational degrees in the hope of converting them to high income, which through accumulation amounts to success, then it's a bit of a stretch to claim to be successful if you're overqualified or underpaid for your work. So the majority is losing out if we use the same old standard to measure success and failure. I fear if a society doesn't prepare its citizenry to take about the new dreams when the old ones crash, people's frustration and disillusionment will break the society. The Russian-American scientist Peter Turchin has a very neat theory for this exact situation. It's called elite overproduction. Basically, it's about the education system have produced way more potential elite wannabes than a society can absorb into its power structure. And those who are left out will cause social disturbances. In the U.S., job prospects for law, language, and gender study graduates used to be very bright. Now, not anymore. So from the ruling caste points of view, the harder it is for them to realize dreams, the easier they'll become agitators and use their skills they've learned to instigate unrests. That's why we need to keep asking ourselves the question, what's the point of education? We all have our answers, but chances are to become more material and self-centered as we age. People say that if you are not an idealist when you're young, you have no heart, but you're still an idealist when you grow old, you have no brain. The world just incentivizes conformity by manipulating our desires. So after a certain point in life, even the most eager idealists get better than the weary. We just stop believing in anything other than money, power, and the pursuit of status. Take a peek. Let me tell you another story, okay? In China, schools hold rallies in the last semester before a college entrance examination to motivate students to make the final dash. This young lady from a mountain village was chosen by her school to give a speech on the rally. She said in an agitated state that, don't despair, we were born weak, but we can live strong. Nobody's doomed to be nobody all his life. One day you'll thank yourself for getting up early to study every day, for the door may be dark, but the high score in the exam paper will shine bright. Her school published the video in hope to inspire, but it went viral and backfired. Thousands of negative remarks flooded the comment section. If you take away personal insults on her presentation style, which might be too feverish to some, more serious critics actually take issue with her central message about education being a life changer. They apparently used to have the same belief that education was their single ticket out of their small hometowns, that from the college they could climb their way up in big cities. But after the hope was let down by reality, they turned into cynics and questioned the assumed promise of meritocracy. Basically, from their point of view, they studied to win, but not everyone could be a winner. So if education couldn't help them win, why bother studying? Why spread a false belief? I don't agree with that conclusion, but clearly they're onto something. 
If we all accept education as the answer to justify social stratification and unequal distribution of resources, the more uniform our answer is, the less valid. So there's a pressing need to find new answers. I believe our education needs to be more pragmatic and more holistic at the same time. Being pragmatic not only means vocational training programs, teaching how to make a shirt. By the way, China is starting to catch up in this regard. Last year, Chinese students won 20 gold medals in the 63 competitions on world skills, which is the Olympics of skills. You know, uh, bricklaying, beauty therapy, carpentry, electronics, etc. But also greater emphasis on letting students understand the role of their skills relative to other value components, like who's your customer? Why do they pay extra? Where does the money go? What can you do to pocket it? So that they become more conscious and adaptive participants in the socioeconomic life. And the holistic part should aim and encourage the search for meaning. Meaning helps us to overcome alienation, which reduces humans to mere containers of skills and exchange whatever content there is for a singular reward. A healthy society is where people with full autonomy and agency of their own take risks to explore the meaning of their lives in all directions and arrive at different gratification in diverse ways. My five-year-old boy dreams to be a space shuttle pilot for hire or a taxi driver in the galaxy. I hope when he grows up he'll pursue his dream and never regret, no matter he ends up in the sky or on the road, for having had a dream in the first place then I would know the world will have become a kinder place for dreamers. With that, I thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you want to learn more about China or have any thoughts on the comments or on the show, please contact us at the email address below. Looking forward to hearing from you.